Hello, everybody. My name is uh, Philippa Gardner. I'm from Imperial College in London, and I'm also the outgoing chair of the BCS Awards Committee. This committee... Uh, in this committee awards the um, Needham Award, which um, we're celebrating tonight, which is for a mid-career academic or industrialist, and the um, Lovelace Medal, which is for a senior academic or industrialist. The audience is brilliant. Thank you very much for coming. We're going to do something a bit different today which is normally we um, give an award for the BCS CPHC uh, Distinguished Dissertation um, done by a different committee, the, the committee just for this uh, job. And every year, people have said to me, why doesn't the PhD student speak? And every year I've gone, yep, that PhD student probably should be speaking. So this year we're going to do something about it. And we're going to have uh, 10 minutes of first um, Ian Phillips from Loughborough introducing the um, PhD student Miltos Alamanis, who has won the um, UK Distinguished Dissertation for this year. So the CPHC, British Computer Society Distinguished Dissertations Competition, has been running for around 30 years now. And the 2018 competition is the first one where I've been chairing the panel that makes the final decision. And in that year, we had over 20 submissions. Um, note that we limit it to three submissions per institution. And of these 20, they were all excellent, which makes it a rather difficult decision to choose the best. So my thanks to all of those, some of you in the audience here, who acted as referees for this competition. After many months of angst, benefited by the Needham Lecture moving from November to June, um, we finally reduced the list of 20 to two submissions, the highly commended and the winner. So the highly commended awarded to Alkmenis Garista from the University of Liverpool, with one of the reviewers stating, this thesis contains some of the strongest results in algorithmic game theory during the last five years. And so to the winner. The winner of the 2018 CPHC BCS Distinguished Dissertations Award is Miltos Alemanis, who studied at the University of Edinburgh, with the reviewer comment of, Dr. Alemanis, as the result of his dissertation work, is the world expert in the field of applying machine learning algorithms to software. So I'm pleased to present him with this award now. And Miltos will now give us a brief talk about his work. Hi. Uh, thanks a lot for the award and the opportunity to speak here today. My thesis was somewhere in the intersection of programming languages, machine learning, and software engineering. It wouldn't be a surprise to anyone in this audience that, the, that software is a core part of our everyday lives. Software, and thus code, can be found everywhere around us, from our phones, fridges, to airplanes and spaceships. Now, traditional methods in program analysis view code as a formal, mathematical object. However, code has two audiences. Of course, the machine that we instructed what to do, but also humans who need to read, maintain, and extend the code. And given how costly it is to perform these tasks, the human aspects within the code are very strong. These human elements within code, such as names, names of variables, names of functions, thinking patterns, comments, all these things form implicit natural coding conventions. And these conventions are a form of a pattern, and since we have patterns, we can start using machine learning. So the idea is that developers implicitly embed knowledge, conventions if you may, in code bases that can be useful for others. 
What if we can statistically analyze the code itself and extract the knowledge to create tools that help software engineers? Since my PhD, I have been interested in discovering and learning from these conventions. Specifically, I did this by looking into source code through a probabilistic lens. By building machine learning models of source code, we can create new tools that may allow new analysis and speed up or improve existing ones by using probabilistic reasoning. The core challenge rests in developing machine learning methods that can handle probabilistically the multifaceted and highly structured aspects of source code. One focus of my PhD was naming. A famous quote says that the beginning of wisdom is to call things by their name. And software engineers strive to name artifacts in a way that each name reflects the functionality and semantics of the code. If we can learn, to some extent, to name software artifacts, maybe we'll be a little bit closer to understanding code uh, through a machine learning lens. Of course, such machine learning tools can help developers pick better names, but also help downstream tasks as they will implicitly learn about some aspects of the meaning of those artifacts. In my thesis, I explored neural network architectures that try to understand parts of the code to predict good names for variables and functions. I showed that to a large extent this is feasible and these machine learning models don't just learn about naming but they start to implicitly reason about aspects of code semantics. So let's take this example, this relatively simple uh, code. And as you can see from the list of the suggestions here, the neural network seems to be understanding that the code reverses the array. But by learning to name, the neural network has captured again to some extent the concept of reversing. The methods like this used in my PhD have now been proved by myself and others, employing additional information about the code structure and semantics. Similarly, these methods are the basis for new machine learning models that find bugs and predict types in dynamically typed code. Of course, as most PhDs, I only scrape the tip of an iceberg, and an increasingly large community has been exploring this area the past years with fruitful results. But I hope to have shown that machine learning is another tool in our quest to build better software and more robust software. These methods have the potential to impact a broad number of daily activities of software engineers. They will improve the editors we write code in, augment the code review tools, and create new static and dynamic analysis. In the future, I hope that these machine learning based tools will make baby steps to act as software developers within a team, as assistants to those software developers, pushing along with the rest of the team. They will automate the small and boring tasks, allowing the team to focus on the actual software that is being built. So whatever the future you imagine about our world, it is reasonable to assume it will be built on software, improved healthcare, Intelligent robots, novel methods of human-computer interaction all have a common underlying base, and this is software. Building increasingly better software engineering tools can help us get there, and I think that machine learning seems to be a very promising tool towards the journey to achieve this. Thanks. I don't know about you, but I, I'm hoping that that will turn into an instant tradition because I thought that was super. So uh, please give feedback afterwards and uh, maybe we can keep that for the next uh, few years. Now to the uh, BCS Needham Lecture. So this award is uh, funded by Microsoft in honor of Roger Needham, who was the first director of a Microsoft research lab outside of the US. And before I uh, introduce um, this lecture, I have to say something about Alex. So the first time I met Alex was in Brazil. I've already got a big grin over my face because I knew her supervisor, Jan Rutten. And it was a very small specialist workshop where some of us were invited to give talks. And uh, we spent the nights in Brazil dancing 
on condition the, we were there at nine o'clock the next morning to be at whatever uh, lecture happened to be on in the morning. But then not only did we know that Alex was uh, a great uh, dancer, but we knew that you know, there was some fire going on there. And now look at her. She's one of the uh, most respected uh, mid-career uh, academics I know as part of my field. So I would like to um, ask Bart Jacobs, the professor from uh, Nijmegen, where Alex spent some time, to come and introduce this uh, lecture properly, because dancing in Brazil is probably not a good enough introduction for Alex. <laughs> Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is, uh, as announced, Bart Jacobs. Um, I'm a professor of software, security, and correctness at Radboud University at Nijmegen in the Netherlands. I'm a former colleague of Professor Alexandra Silva in Nijmegen, and I'm happy to introduce her to you here tonight. After studying mathematics and computer science in her home country, Portugal, Alexandra came to Amsterdam to do her PhD at the Research Center for Mathematics and Computer Science, known in the Netherlands and, and abroad as CWI. Her supervisor, already mentioned, was my colleague and good friend, Professor Jan Rutte. Um, <clears throat> and in the 1990s, Jan Rutte and I had started, or restarted, depending on your perspective, a field uh, called Co-algebra. Now, uh, before I tell a little bit about co-algebra, uh, let me say a bit about algebra first. Algebra is an established discipline that's not only of mathematical interest in itself, uh, but also offers a toolbox of calculation techniques which are extremely useful in other disciplines. Um, <clears throat> many of these techniques have now been automated and can be used easily via what are new, known as computer algebra tools, such as MATLAB or Axiom or Mathematica. <coughs> Coalgebra co -algebra <coughs> is relatively young. It's a, it's a discipline with a mathematical discipline, you could say, which really grew out, grew out of computer science. Um, it is sometimes introduced as the dual of algebra. Uh, the co suggested or uh, suggests already this dual aspects. Um, this perspective is certainly correct, uh, but it requires a certain level of familiarity with the field to really appreciate this, this dual perspective. But in a more direct way, one can say <coughs> that uh, co-algebra is about states, about observations, and about behavior. Um, we can all understand that a computer has an internal state. Um, the state that is given by all the zeros and ones that are in memory or in all registers in the computer. This state is not observable from the outside. This is also a good thing because users would definitely be bewildered by all the details. Instead, what we can observe about computers is what we see typically via screen, via a, a, a speaker, or maybe some lights flashing on the computer now and then. <clears throat> this difference, but this difference is crucial between a complex internal state uh, of a system and the limited observations that we can make about it at the outside. Um, this this uh, difference is at the core of the field of coalgebra. <clears throat> Obviously, this difference between, um, <clears throat> um, um, uh, between a complex internal state and, and a limited view from the outside uh, occurs in many more areas. For instance, in biology, when you talk about biolog biological systems, or in neuroscience. Um, although applications of coalgebra to those areas are still limited, they do exist, uh, <clears throat> there is still clearly room for further applications. Computer scientists tend to abstract away from compu uh, concrete computer uh, systems via various forms of abstractions known, uh, known as automata, 
which I'm sure will feature prominently in the talk that we're about to hear. Typical questions in the area of coalgebra are which states are behaviorally equivalent? This means which states are possibly internally diff different, but from the outside we cannot see the difference. Such states are also called bisimilar in the field, and an important part of the field is devoted to finding proof techniques uh, for, for uh, producing a mat mathematical proof of bisimilarity. The proof methodology is called co-induction, as a dual, again, to induction, an important technique in, in algebra for proving things, especially about the natural numbers or more generally about finitely generated algebraic structure. Uh, Professor Silva has substantial contributions to the usability of co-induction, uh, in, uh, for instance, in uh, functional programming to reason about infinite data structures. Other types of questions arise about whether there is a complete set of axioms that characterize by similarity <clears throat> in a particular setting. This is also where Professor Silva has contributed significantly, for instance, in a PhD thesis, for which I uh, was a member of the reading committee. Um, before handing over to her, I would like to mention that I'm especially pleased to introduce today's speaker at the lecture series named after Professor Roger Needham. Uh, he's a pioneer in computer security. I teach a first year computer security course at my university with typically some 300 first year students, and Professor Needham is mentioned there explicitly every year. Um, <clears throat> um, he is very famous about what is called the Needham Schroeder Protocol. <clears throat> it's, a, a, it's a protocol, it's an exchange of messages between two parties, typically called Alice and Bob, who want to prove to each other who they are. They use some elementary cryptography for, for, for doing this. This protocol is famous in both a positive but also a slightly negative sense. I don't know if everyone is aware of this, but uh, it's, it's good to mention uh, uh, that too. But I'll, I'll definitely want to give a positive twist to this. Um, <clears throat> this this uh, protocol gave, uh, formed the basis for, for various more complicated authentication protocols like the widely used Kerberos system and, and uh, follow-up systems. But the needham schroeder protocol is also a bit infamous <coughs> uh, because it contains a very, very subtle flaw. <coughs> uh, it is a way to, uh, there is a way to uh, run the messages in the protocol in such a way that authentication of, of one of the parties is not really achieved. This flaw in the protocol is so subtle that it took 15 years to be discovered. Um, and that's why it's an ideal protocol for using, for, for, to be used in teaching for first year students, because they get to see, one, how subtle the area is, how difficult it is to get things right. And uh, Professor Needham is also famous for, for a statement that security protocols are three line programs that people uh, don't manage to get right. And he was in a perfect <laughs> situation to say this himself. So it's, it's not only a, a very good uh, protocol for teaching, but also it's a comfort to all of us that such great people also make flaws. <laughs> and, and sometimes flaws uh, have, a, have a great didactic value, and also, as we all know, we learn from mistakes. But today, uh, <coughs> we have Professor Silva's lecture. Now, it would be very appropriate if this lecture would also contain a, a, a very subtle flaw, which would, which would take 15 years to be discovered, and which many generations after her, uh, or many generations of students will have to learn about. Although, truly, I hope there's no flaw. Um, Alexandra Silva is a leader of her generation. <clears throat> She's also a leader of the field. And I'm very happy uh, to be able to introduce her to you tonight. I'm, look very, <coughs> I'm very much looking forward to a presentation, and I guess so are you. Thank you for your attention.
Thank you uh, very much for uh, the honor to give this talk uh, here tonight at the Royal Society. Uh, I'm very grateful to uh, receive this uh, mid-career award. Uh, I'm also very nervous to give this talk because I feel the weight uh, of this award and of all the kind words that uh, Philippa and Bart already um, said about me, including the dancing in Brazil. <laughs> now my PhD students all knew about this. Um, so what I'd like to do, I'd like to spend the next uh, 35, 40 minutes telling you about some work I did in the past four or five years, but mostly telling you about what I want to do in the future. I think what is nice about these mid-career awards, or any award, is that you get a little freedom to dream and to tell people uh, what you would like to do, even if you don't get to do it, even if it's slightly impossible, um, and even if you might introduce some subtle flaws that will take 15 years or 30 years um, to find. So broadly, I'm interested in the verification of software and hardware, and I um, have a certain fascination with using uh, algebraic and co-algebraic methods to um, carry out these verification tasks. Um, I also have a certain uh, fascination with the fast pace at which things seem to be developing and, and changing in technology. Back in uh, 2015, I was in uh, Tokyo for a conference, and I met for the first time the uh, famous professor, Peter O'Hearn, who at that time was already a uh, research manager at Facebook. And he gave a keynote um, at this conference we were at, and he put up this uh, mantra that they use at Facebook, move fast and break things. And he told us about the idea behind this mantra and how to increase coding productivity, the teams were tolerating having some bugs because you could produce things fast and then you would break them, you would find the bugs and you would fix them. Now, after listening to this talk of uh, Peter, I came home and I searched a little bit about it and I found a, an article about um, a talk that Mark Zuckerberg gave and it turned out there was a second slide uh, in that talk. So it seemed that they had just changed the mantra to a different thing. And now it was move fast with stable infrastructure. And the point was that they realized that the moving fast had consequences. Namely, they were introducing all these bugs that, yes, were being fixed, but also slowed them down. And by monitoring this along the years, they realized that actually increasing productivity by moving fast didn't pay off um, in the long run. So I have a different mantra in the research I do, and it looks um, a bit more like this, uh, which is keep calm and have strong foundations. And that's what I want to tell you about. I want to tell you about a different way of um, looking at um, software and hardware verification uh, that comes from, from this idea that um, good uh, design has, is, has, good found, has strong foundations in um, algebraic and, and co-algebraic theory. Um, the increase of complexity in software and, and hardware um, is something that we um, study in computer science, but it is not something that is unique to computer science. In fact, if we go back to um, other areas, like in car technology, I found this picture recently of um, what is supposed to be the first car in 1886 by Mercedes-Benz. And if you look at this car, it looks pretty cool, um, but it also looks very simple. And um, Mercedes has just released some uh, prototype pictures of their um, self-driving car, which looks quite different. And if you read a little bit about um, these, two, uh, these two cars that were separated by a few centuries, uh, there's actually a patent from the original car that you can find online, and you can look at it. And what is striking is that this um, car had a very simple design with a limited number of components. And what this resulted in is if there was an accident, and I couldn't quite find the picture of that car having an accident, maybe it never had an accident, 
Um, but if there was an accident in one of these early cars, there was a very simple way to detect the problem because the number of components was so small. And there was also a very clear accountability on whom had introduced the problem because the number of people actually working on each car was um, quite small. Now, if you look at this uh, more recent prototype of um, the Mercedes self-driving car, it is a nightmare. Uh, on the one hand, it is a very complex design. Uh, the patent goes over many, many, many pages. It has an extremely high number of uh, components that are all interconnected. It's not so much that the hardware is complex, but there's a lot of software um, involved. And it is very complex to detect any problem that you might have, which also means there is no clear <laughs> accountability. Uh, it could be that this self-driving car kills someone on the road, um, and this has happened with other brands, and you don't know why the car has decided to hit a person instead of hitting a wall, for instance, or um, if it has several uh, obstacles that it has um, to choose, it is not clear we, why the car is choosing which object. So there's no clear accountability. And on top of this complexity, a lot of these cars are supposed to work in networks. So you will have a lot of them communicating and again, making decisions based on information that they are getting from other cars, which they don't have direct access to. So when you face this state of technology and the consequences it might have in terms of life loss and, and financial losses, um, you start wondering, how can you prevent this? And this is where uh, modeling and verification, in my opinion, has a big opportunity to actually help the world. So I, I think of modeling and verification as a sort of greed. On the one hand, you have modeling, which is a sort of principled approach to design both software and hardware. You can make a model. You can then spend a couple of months testing this model. You can try to find design flaws. You can then adjust the design of your model, and so on. And this can go on for a long time, and therefore is most of the times too expensive and too slow to be used in practice. Now, when it comes to verification, most of verification techniques can be applied pre- and post-production, both for software and hardware. So that's a big plus, because that means you can let people develop software and hardware at a fast pace and still offer them the verification tools to monitor if the software or hardware have bugs. However, a lot of the verification techniques end up suffering from not being scalable or not being compositional, which uh, means that then applicability is reduced. So these sort of minus points are something that the community is trying to overcome. And that is the only way that both modeling and verification will find their place in mainstream development. So the things I'm gonna to talk to you about today could be divided in two parts. One is about language design, which is about modeling and one is about learning, which is about verification. And these two things are connected, at least in my world, by a structure called automata, which I'll tell you about in a little while. And it is my belief, and this is what I'm working on at the moment and what I would like to work on in, in the next few years, that using automata and using the intersection, the automata as, it, as the structure at the intersection of modeling and verification, that we can improve both uh, negative points that modeling and verification might be accused of having. So I want to tell you a little bit about language design now and how automata plays a role in the design of a language um, that we are using to look at um, networks. So let's look at networks in a very, very naive and simple way as a structure that has packets traveling through it. And maybe the only thing you care about is that a certain packet arrives from A to B. And uh, if that's the only thing you care about, then maybe you don't need a very complex language to model this network. 
And maybe you don't need a very complex language to actually verify properties if the only thing you want to know is if packets arrive to their destination. So in fact, you can use a very, very simple um, encoding of how the packets are being forwarded to the through the network. So um, the switches in the network, those devices, those little round devices have uh, switch forwarding tables that tell you based on a certain property where a certain packet is going. So you can encode what these internal tables in the devices are doing as a very simple imperative program that just runs a bunch of tests and then ends up processing a bunch of actions. And the thing about this encoding and this observation is that this is the only thing you need to start applying some things we know from programming language semantics, namely that simple imperative programs have uh, semantics given in the form of automata. Okay, so this is the first drawing of an automaton and possibly one of the few I'm going to show you. So an automaton is a mathematical structure that has states, and you can think of the states as describing a certain state of the network, in particular whether a certain packet is being processed and you're looking at the header of this packet and checking if this packet is, for instance, an SSH packet or is not an SSH packet. And based on a certain test, you will make a transition in state and end up in a different state in which you, again, can do new tests and maybe can do some actions like changing the port for which the packet is going. And so automata are extremely operational in the way they describe what is happening in the network. And this is what we're going to explore in order to um, think of the network as an operational process and use uh, verification tools that we already have for automata. So what we did uh, back in 2015 using this observation that you can encode switch forwarding tables as simple imperative programs and translate these imperative programs into these gadgets, these automata, we showed that you can actually then look at certain verification questions, namely connectivity, so whether a packet can reach um, from point A to point B. And you can also check whether um, your network is uh, loop-free, so whether the programs you have running in your network, your configurations are not introducing loops. And just using the encoding in terms of automata, we um, had a prototype implementation um, that without being uh, too sophisticated, ended up performing um, really well, and you could check connectivity in um, a well-known benchmark in, in networking in a sort of linear fashion. So uh, in these graphs, you see a linear increase of um, the number of checks we're doing in the network, and in the x-axis, you have um, the size of the network and um, rules uh, increasing. So, uh, in essence, what we showed is that the simple imperative programs describing network forwarding functions and having this correspondence with automata open the door to a scalable implementation. So this was kind of a nice observation. And me coming from sort of programming language semantics, I was really excited about this. Um, so this is joint work with uh, my colleagues in Cornell, um, Nate Foster and Dexter Cozen. And Nate, coming more from the networking side of things, was excited but a bit cautious because um, he thought, you know, will the networking people be that impressed? Um, so I was wondering, why wouldn't the networking people be impressed? And then we thought a bit about it and said, well, you know, we can do reachability, which is pretty good because that's something they care about. Uh, but so far, our programs are very deterministic and I'm not sure that will really um, convince people. And um, yeah, if you talk with, with people in, in networking <laughs> and uh, we have a group of those at, uh, at UCL, um, <coughs> These are, these are actually not their questions, but I decided to use their pictures to illustrate my point, um, is that you know, there's a lot beyond um, reachability. I mean, you, you, a lot of the times you want to also analyze whether there is congestion in the network or uh, whether the network is tolerant to faults 
Or maybe you have some bugs that your network program has that are not uh, super evident because they come from some um, concurrency going on. So at this point, um, me being a PL researcher, can come up with a um, kind of general answer to this, which is okay, we have this language and it works well for reachability. So why should we throw that away? We shouldn't throw that away. We should just take that language and explore the idea that we have explored for decades in, in sort of PL semantics that we can have a core language and extend it in a conservative way. So we don't want to lose the properties of the language we already have. And we're going to extend that language in a way that is compositional so that we can then also preserve the properties of the algorithms we already have. And this is the approach we've been exploring um, for the last four years. And we'll, we like to refer to it as the CAT tower principle. Um, CAT, as in K-A-T, stands for Clean Algebra with Tests, which is something that goes back in fact, to 1952, um, to Stefan Kline, who um, explored the connection between regular expressions describing um, regular languages and deterministic finite automata. And that correspondence, known as Kline's theorem, has become one of the um, cornerstones of theoretical computer science uh, and has inspired much, much research, um, including our own. Uh, Dexter Cozen, back in, in the early 90s, extended Kleene's result to be able to handle tests, or in other words, to be able to handle control flow in simple imperative programs. And that was kind of the starting point of um, our work. We then extended this language with um, networking primitives to talk about reachability. And then, later on, uh, motivated by this idea that um, networking um, is much more than reachability, we extended it with uh, probabilities to be able to talk about congestion, and we are currently looking at extending it um, with concurrent primitives, uh, which turned out to be much more um, challenging than we expected in the beginning. Um, but one thing I would like to say, and that's why I put the years on this slide, is that a lot of this research has taken um, many years. And one is not because we're lazy, um, but uh, because it is, it is a challenging problem, one. And two, we have insisted in doing it in this extremely principled way, which um, you might criticize and say that it is not fast enough to have the impact, the immediate impact it could have in industry. But um, I really believe that one sometimes has to take it slow in order to devise the languages um, that might become the languages of the future in terms of verification uh, in a solid way. Because if we use what we want to do next week in industry, we might be making decisions in our language design that will then not be, you will not be able to backtrack later on when you realize this was a mistake. So the way we've been developing this um, CAT Tower has been slow and steady, but um, we have some interesting results that the networking people appreciate. And I'll tell you a little bit how uh, we're now looking at hardware verification using this language. And um, I think it's, it's pretty cool. And since I got this award, I think I should also um, say to the young people in the audience that sometimes taking three years to prove a theorem is no shame, because sometimes that's what it takes. And, you should not rush the development of something just because um, there's pressure on the next deadline. So the way we, we developed this um, CAT tower principle was, as I said before, um, making sure that every extension was conservative and didn't break anything we had about the semantics of the language, but also uh, the complexity of the algorithms we developed for each language. And we insisted very much in this idea that the semantics has to be compositional, because otherwise um, there's very little hope of um, scalable verification. So I'll show you, I'll flash you a recent um, graph we have. It's something coming up next month at PLDI, uh, actually illustrating the scalability of the probabilistic language. So we, had, um, we have this probabilistic extension, and we implemented a um, 
native backend to test uh, for certain congestion properties. And these are the, this was run on a bunch of uh, networks with nodes up to um, 10,000 switches. And we also did an implementation of our language in a very uh, popular probabilistic model checker called PRISM, developed in Oxford. Um, and PRISM has been optimized for a long time. And as it turns out, our naive uh, native backend actually performed pretty well compared to PRISM that has been um, developed over so many years. So I think this comes to show that sometimes taking your time to develop the foundations and the theory behind the language actually has positive consequences later also for the scalability of your um, implementation. And this came to, as a surprise to us, and we thought for a while there was a bug in the implementation. Um, because back in 2014, we had a <coughs> theorem saying that um, equivalence in our language was p-space complete. And um, p-space complete is bad. If you don't know what p-space complete is, it's just bad. <laughs> and um, there's a famous quote by a prominent academic. Uh, can never remember the difference between p-space and outer space. Um, but anyway, so it's bad. So we were a bit surprised by um, by the fact that the implementation seemed to scale so well. And we puzzled about it for a couple of years. Um, and recently, we discovered, and this is an upcoming theorem, so maybe this is where the subtle mistake is, uh, that deciding equivalence can be done in almost linear time. Actually, I see a typo on the slide, so there is a mistake. Um, <laughs> But this only works for a fragment of the language, something we call the guarded fragment. And it's not very relevant what the fragment is, but it is a fragment. And as it turns out, that fragment is enough for all the network properties we were verifying and that we want to verify. And that's why that's what we were observing in the implementation, because the implementation was not exploiting the whole language. We were just encoding the networks and the network properties we had. And they all fit into this fragment of linear algebra with tests that now we have a proof that so happens to be more efficient than the full language. And this, was, this came as a big surprise to, to all of us. And um, I am very uh, excited about this result. And I'm very excited about um, the, draft, the draft that will be online hopefully in two weeks. Uh, because actually this fragment just opened um, a door to study a very different type of, of language. And that's something that I really um, am looking forward to doing the next couple of years. So just an, a sort of pause and, and summary of what I've showed you so far. Um, language design with a compositional semantics is good for scalability. And this is um, something I think we might not have believed when we started doing this work. We did it because we enjoyed it, and it seemed like a fun thing to do, to use clean algebra to uh, study networks. Um, but in fact, uh, it has proven to be a very productive way of, of doing network verification, and um, this is a good thing. Now, you might also wonder, is this really um, a real uh, applicable language? And um, it is. In fact, there is a, um, a new language, a new kid in the block in, in software defined networks called P4. And P4 is a language that um, has been developed in parallel with a um, new chip called Tofino. And there is now a way to compile P4 into um, to run on, on Tofino. And there's a whole community looking at the development of, of P4 and that verification tools for for P4, and uh, my colleague Nate Foster is at the forefront of this, and there is a very tight connection between this theoretical language I showed you, this very simple imperative language, and P4. So actually, you can look at the fragment of P4 in um, the language we've been studying, which is uh, pretty cool. Now, what I want to tell you next is about the other side of this picture, namely that the um, automata connection is um, good 
also for black box testing and verification. So the fact we have language design and we have the semantics in terms of automata now opens a bridge to go into model learning. And these principles can um, be applied beyond networks, and I, I, I will not have much time to, to tell you about that, but the, what I mean by principles here is all these algebraic and, and co-algebraic foundations we have um, for these languages. And the fact that we studied them from this abstract perspective actually uh, gives us the tools to apply this to different things. So that uh, pipeline I showed you for P4 is actually a pipeline that exists at um, different levels. So we have this kind of custom-made hardware to run certain things, certain types of algorithms. So Tofino comes from the software-defined networking world. Then there's TPU, which is a um, tensor processing unit that uh, has a language developed in parallel with it called TensorFlow, which is used in uh, machine learning and, and to uh, perform certain machine learning tasks uh, very efficiently. And then we have more traditional pipelines, like in the graphics world, where you have a GPU, or um, in the regular uh, computing processing unit, where you have a CPU, and you might have high-level languages like C or Java or Python that get compiled um, down to uh, machine instructions. And if you look at these uh, pictures, you can wonder where can things go wrong? Well, things can go wrong everywhere pretty much. So things can go wrong because the language itself um, had a problem. So maybe the semantics of the language was um, not exactly what the programmer thought. Or things could go wrong because the person who implemented the compiler misunderstood what he was supposed to be um, translating, or things could go wrong because the hardware is faulty. And when you have such amount of failure points, you have to start wondering how can you help, and can formal methods help in avoiding these mistakes? Well, I've shown you that at the level of the language design, there's a way to um, have a more precise semantics, either using automata or, or other mathematical objects. At the level of the compilers, there's um, a long uh, tradition on uh, having your compiler certified to make sure that the compiler is not changing the semantics of the language you, you start with. And, and these projects, um, there's a very famous project for the C compiler called Comcert. Um, and then for hardware, there's um, a tradition of doing a lot of testing and, and model checking uh, to make sure that the hardware that gets shipped does not um, have any bugs. And, but still, the problem with these techniques, in particular with um, certified compilers and, and hardware testing, is that they are very expensive, both in terms of time and, and the money that companies need to invest uh, to have them. And so, is there a way we can do better than this? And I want to argue that using um, automata and, and abstract methods, you can actually replace some of these um, certifications and testing by um, automated modeling and verification. And automated modeling is um, an attempt to remove the fact that uh, modeling is a very time-consuming um, and expert task. And so we're going to look at automated modeling as a sort of crystal ball approach. And the idea is the following. We want to have one of these gadgets, like a Tofino chip or a TPU or a certain implementation of um, a compiler. And we want to look at these things as if they are absolute black boxes. So we're going to interact with them but we don't know who implemented it or how they implemented it. The only thing we know is what type of actions this code or this hardware is able to perform. So we're going to interact with them, and by interacting with them, we're going to observe traces of what um, these things can produce. And based on those traces, we're going to build a model that's going to look like um, an automaton that will capture part of the behavior that we have observed. Now, based on this uh, model, we're then going to try to 
show that the model itself is correct. So we're going to run this model as a monitor, and we're going to check, we're going to model check, and based on potential bugs we find while we're doing this model checking, um, we're going to refine our model. And this whole process can mostly be done in an automatic way, which means you can basically having it run in the background without interfering um, with the developers, which is, which is a good thing. Now, this whole uh, schematic actually, again, goes back to some traditional research in formal language theory, namely um, to Dana Angloin in 87. And Dana Angloin has this um, seminal paper on an algorithm she calls L star. And L star is a black box algorithm, like the one I showed you, but the black box, instead of having a um, system like a chip or a compiler, simply has a what she calls a teacher that knows about a certain regular language L. And there is a learner that wants to build a model, namely a minimal automaton accepting this language. And um, this learner is going to interact with the teacher by asking very simple questions, namely, is a word in the language? And the answer is either yes or no from the teacher. And then at some point, there's this idealized world in which the learner can ask, is the language of my hypothesis? So the learner is going to ask a bunch of questions. And then at some point, maybe the learner thinks, I know which language you have. So I'm going to guess. And then it can ask the teacher, is my guess correct? And the teacher is going to reply back either with yes, and the learner is happy, or with no, and a counterexample that allows you to refine your uh, model. So if I go back to my previous slide, you see that this is pretty much um, a similar scheme to what I was advocating here, but in this very simple world of um, regular languages. So in, in this more complex world, in which you have um, real code or, or, or real hardware, um, you of course cannot assume that you can ask the hardware, is my model correct? I mean, you won't have the answer. Uh, but there are ways to get around it and to kind of get a good approximation to um, know whether your uh, model is correct, at least up to a certain confidence, which most of the time is what you really want to know. So um, going back to Angloin, so this uh, algorithm that goes back to, to the 80s um, was kind of forgotten for, for quite a while. And then I think back 10 years ago, it was rediscovered in uh, verification. And um, people appreciated the fact that regular languages, despite the fact of being so simplistic actually can be quite um, useful. And so the reason I ended up looking at this area at all goes back to this picture here, which I'll tell you a little bit about. Um, this is a picture of a um, Dutch. So uh, there's a Dutch bank called ABN AMRO. And when you want to access your bank account online, you need to get an access code that you get from putting your um, bank card into this little uh, device that looks like a calculator. You then input your PIN, and you get back, back an access code that you can put in the browser. And um, it's, in, it's supposed to increase the security with which you can access your bank account. And the picture that is on this slide is actually version 2 of that um, device because version one had a um, serious bug. And um, I have a colleague in Nijmegen, Eric Paul, uh, and um, other colleague called Fritz Van Drager, who were looking at um, automatically trying to find bugs in protocols of, of bank cards and uh, passport chips and um, devices like the one in this uh, picture. And so they decided to take L star and see if they could use L star to learn the protocol that um, this machine was running inside. And so this thing here on the right is a little Lego device that they built that automatically would key in sequences of um, pins and other actions into the machine. And so this is your automated 
part of the verification. And little Lego machine spent a couple of hours pressing buttons. And then there's a cable coming out of it that basically records all the outputs that you got from your interactions. And based on that, they built a um, model that had not many states, about 10 or 12 states. And they did that for version 1. And they did that for version 2. And indeed, version 1 had a bug that by then AB and AMRO knew about it. And that's why they were replacing all of them by uh, version 2. And the bug was very simple. So you, to help older people access their bank account in case they were not fast enough putting their uh, PIN code and then the code into the browser, you could connect this device via USB to your computer at home. And then you could basically put your PIN code and the device would send the access code directly to the browser via this USB connection. And um, what would happen was that if you would do a certain sequence of plugging the USB and the PIN code um, in the wrong way, there was actually one way that you could access a bank account without having the right PIN code uh, for the card. It had to be a very specific sequence, which probably is very unlikely that anyone ever did, but it was possible. And this is what they discovered um, in this way. So what I think this shows is um, that even, in, you know, even using very simple tools like regular languages, you can perform quite interesting verification tasks. And, and this is what we want to now take forward in the picture I showed you before with um, these hardware um, devices, namely with Tofino and with the P4 um, compiler. Uh, to make sure that these P4 programs that are running on, on networks um, are correct and that the hardware is indeed doing the task that is um, supposed to be doing. And uh, in order to do that, we have to, ge to generalize a little bit from regular languages. Um, and this is where all the work we've been doing so far will pay off because now we know which type of automata we can use to model uh, the behaviors that are modeled, that, sorry, that are programmed in P4 and that are actually running in, um, inside the chip like Tofino. And we can also use um, the knowledge we have from studying L star from an algebraic and co-algebraic perspective to actually then generalize Angloin's result um, to other types of, of automata. And so, um, I want to um, now conclude the sort of technical part of, of my talk by saying that um, a lot of these things I've shown you, in particular this verification of the Tofino chip, is really what I want to do in the coming years. I don't know if it is possible to do, but I have strong belief it is, and I have a strong belief that we have now the tools that we need to do it um, in an efficient and scalable way. And um, there's a lot of stars in, in my world, and that's why I put this slide here. And there's uh, a lot of this work is developed with um, my students and my collaborators, in particular, um, Nate Foster at Cornell and Dexacosin at Cornell as well, uh, whom I want to uh, thank very much for the long-term uh, collaborations and all the fun. Um, and of course, you know, there's a part of my life outside work and um, I think you've seen a child running around today and um, my family and, and my friends have been um, a great support and inspiration so to them I also want to, um, to say thank you. But um, before I, I conclude I would also like to say that looking back uh, a couple of days ago I was looking at who won this award in the last uh, few years and I realized that um, there's a lot of great people who um, have been here before me and I also realized that a lot of the things I want to do and a lot of the things I've done and I've talked about have appeared in a lot of the awards that were given in the last, um, in the last 15 years. Um, so it starts immediately with Jane Hilston's, uh, who was, I think, the first person to get this award back in 2004. And also in, in her thesis, um, sorry, in her um, award lecture, there's a lot about compositionality. And you can see that um, I've marked a few, um, a few of the awards that are uh, related to, to uh, the work I've talked about. And a lot of them talk about compositionality and program verification and the challenges we have from, from systems evolving very 
fast. And um, for instance, last year's uh, Ali Donaldson's uh, lecture on, on MariCore programming and how to go really fast without crashing. It's a very cool title. And um, you know, I would prefer to go really slow without crashing, but it's good that people dream to go really fast without uh, crashing. But, but this is to say that this trend of, of looking, this research line of looking at methods for verification, scalable verification, developing programs that do uh, what they are supposed to be doing and that eventually do something good, like Byron Cook's lecture in 2009, is something that's been around for a long time. And I expect it will be around for many, many decades to come, given the role that software and hardware have in our daily lives. Mark Handley concluded his Needham Award talk in 2007 by saying that, above all, build real systems. I would say, above all, model, build, verify, and test real systems, because you better be safe than sorry. And I hope that in the last 40-odd uh, minutes, I've given you a little glimpse on um, this idea that different areas like automata and programming language semantics can have interesting bridges with more practical um, and fast-moving areas like hardware, software-defined networks. And um, you know, in the spirit that we awarded the PhD um, prize in the beginning, I also would like to um, do a little bit of promotion for um, the upcoming PhD thesis of my students, one of which will come in, in a month's time, roughly. Uh, a lot of them are working on um, black box testing and automata learning, on concurrency and networks, and Stefan Smolko, who really is Nate's student at Cornell, but worked with me, is working on probabilistic netcat. And they are the ones who inspire me and uh, really do a lot of the hard work uh, of the things I've shown um, today and the things I also want to do in the future. So uh, with a big thanks to uh, them and to the awards committee, in particular to Philippa, also for all her support in general along the last, since we met each other in Brazil, and for all the inspiration as well. And I also would like to thank the MFPS CALCO participants to um, indulge me in coming to yet another talk today after spending a long day at the conference and um, the members of the general public and, and other academics who are in the room. Many thanks for uh, listening to me today. Thank you. So just to say a bit more, there's at UCL um, a couple of specialist conferences going on. One is MFPS and the other is CALCO. And CALCO in particular is this specialist conference on um, co-algebra that Bart was talking ab about that underpins a lot of what Alex was saying. And due to the general audience, she took pity on uh, uh, the general members of the audience, so didn't get into all those fine details. And I think has got away with it from the point of view of the Calco crowd. But thank you, um, guys, for coming. Now, please, has anyone any questions? My name's Cathy Spur. Um, thank you very much for an inspiring talk. Um, I have a, a question, aside from the question as to how did you manage to get all those cats to stand one on top of the other. Um, but it's a question in, relate to, in relation to your um, slide on automated modeling. Would you be able to put that back up again for me, please? If it's not too much trouble. Yeah, that's great. Uh, it's a great slide. Um, I'm interested in complexity. I've been doing modeling for many, many years, and I'm interested in complexity. I'm interested in the complexity that we can model ourselves. So I notice that you've got a little human eye down there. Um, 
I, I totally agree with everything you've got there. But the human input, in my experience, does impose a limit on what we can model and what we can test. Um, some of the very simplest heuristics are those from Miller um, many, many years ago, which relate to the capacity of our short-term memory, which uh, an off-the-cuff figure is often given as 7 plus or minus 2, uh, or, about, or thereabouts. I'm wondering how much the uh, capacity of uh, a human to handle complexity has actually influenced the techniques and the language that you've produced. Because in my experience, there is that limit. And I can't see, whatever the limit is, I can't see how we can get above it. But I'd be interested to know whether you think we can. Thank you. <clears throat> yeah, thank you. That's a great question. And um, to be honest, I think I got myself in trouble for no reason. Because that human eye um, really is not a human. Um, so this whole picture, you can think of it as the human eye being mostly a um, program that will be uh, running all the interaction and also will be looking at the model and looking at the equivalence between the model and the real system. So at some point in my early slides, I mentioned that uh, we have these results on how complex or not complex deciding equivalence is. And the fact that now we have some um, some new results on showing that the equivalence of certain programs can be done very efficiently is what we're going to explore to actually tame the complexity of approximating the real system. So I put the human eye there because it looks very pretty, but um, I got myself in, in trouble. But uh, it is a good question. And there is, of course, there will still be some human interaction at some point when a certain bug, bug gets detected. It might be that it is a false positive because your modeling was to um, course, and then you might have to ask a human to double check your trace. Um, but at that stage, you're going to give the human a very clear indication of where you think the bug is. So the human interaction will be at a much simplistic level, and the complexity will be handled by the program itself. More questions, please. Uh, Brunella Longo, I'm an ICT consultant and I look at, at the future from uh, policy and overall project management. So I've tried to synthesize what I understood of this fascinating approach and also referring to a previous Needham lecture um, given by Professor Dino Di Stefano. And Correct me if I'm wrong. Is this a, a way to approach um, modeling and verification projects uh, with an actuarial uh, state of, of mind um, opposite to a Bayesian inference um, culture? Uh, or um, generalized fantasizes? No, I mean, there, there's a crucial difference from the thing I'm advocating and um, what fits into, say, Bayesian inference. Um, so this type of learning is what would be called active learning because there's this active interaction between um, the person or the software you're using to learn and the actual system. Whereas in um, inference, you basically have a log of what has happened over a certain period of time, and then you try to infer a model from, from that log. Whereas here, you really assume you have access to your system. So if you need some more information, you'll just go there and ask. And that's what makes it a, a slightly different process and makes it slightly more an, amenable for certain verification tasks. Okay, can we have some more questions? And I, can I just say for the MFPS and CALCO um, participants, don't be wusses, you can ask a question too. Hi, Zora. Hi, um, my name's Trevor Nell. We develop software um, in industrial automation. And my question is, is the black box cognizant of the tests that you expect to execute, or is it truly a black box? 
so there aren't any communication interface issues? Okay, that's also a, a great uh, question. Uh, I suppose I should have said it's more of a great box approach. So you have, a, you have some knowledge of um, how you can interact, and you have some knowledge of the actions that you can use to interact. So that's part of your prior knowledge, and you can use that then to start the process. And maybe you'll learn more along the way, but that's at the start of the process. Uh, so pure black box will be very hard to use in practical verification. Hi, Alexandra. I got really excited uh, by the whole talk, but especially by the, um, the result that uh, you say you are not 100% uh, sure yet. Uh, it's the one about the guarded uh, uh, cut expression. So, so if I understood correctly, you... Uh, identified a fragment of cut for which the problem of equivalence is, uh, is, uh, is polynomial. So n now for me, the, the, the natural question is, what is this fragment just for a uh, cleaning algebra? Because this is a really long-standing problem and quite yeah. meaningful for me, at least. We don't have a, an answer to that question because we, our fragment very much relies on the control flow. So we very much rely on the fact we have uh, tests, and that's what helps us tame the size of the automata. So the automata we get from our fragment are purely deterministic from a testing point of view, and that's why the checking can be done in polynomial uh, time. So we, we have that question as well, and we are wondering whether we can encode that question into our current fragment, but I don't have an answer to that. And if I start conjecturing, then Bart will start taking notes and in 15 years come and check. Uh, so I, I won't conjecture on that. This is one of the cool network researchers. Uh, I don't know if I'm going to live up to that. Uh, this is Brad Carp at UCL. Hi, Alex. I really enjoyed your talk. I wanted to ask whether this approach takes account of performance in any way, because sometimes correctness involves performance, since you mentioned self-driving cars. Um, you know, sometimes if, if you're talking about Tofino, for example, or just mundane networking, you know, whether, whether in all cases for all inputs your packet will be forwarded within a certain amount of time or fall off some fast path, does that figure in here or is that beyond what this approach does? So that's, that's a great question. Uh, I knew you would have a new question for me to add to that slide. Um, so the timed extension, which would enable us to then analyze performance, um, is not yet there. So we're, we, you know, I showed that tower of cats, and um, the timed one is uh, beyond what we can do right now. And we haven't, because we have a list of things we would like to see through, we haven't looked at that one. But I agree it is a crucial uh, thing that should be looked at eventually. You have mentioned con concurrency uh, as one of the problems. Have you looked at the deadlock detection problem as such? Um, We've looked at uh, loop freedom, which is a, a sort of deadlock detection. We've also looked at um, detecting very simple um, bugs that, that come, for instance, by wrongly implementing a round-robin protocol, which you then end up getting a deadlock of a packet being forward between two um, nodes that don't know what to do with it. Um, but we haven't looked at the general problem of deadlocks. So we've looked at very specific types of deadlocks that fit in our current language. Any more questions? OK. So I spotted a few things in the um, slide to do with the uh, Needham Award winners. So in particular, first, there was this cool network of researchers from UCL. I would think of them more as a rogue gallery or something like that. And I had 
this bizarre thing because I was talking to the three of them outside this room just before doing this lecture. So that was a bit weird. But in particular, there's been an emphasis on um, Mark Hadley, who's uh, got a Needham Award. There's also Jane Hilston, who's um, over here. She also got um, one of the BCS uh, CPH Distinguished Dissertation Awards and is now head of department at um, Edinburgh. That's just showing, you know, sort of how these awards are intertwining with these most amazing um, academic and industrial researchers in um, the UK. I want to thank, in particular, um, Ian Phillips, because I didn't get it right earlier, for, um, <laughs> for spending a long time um, uh, assessing the awards, and in particular, giving Miltos um, his Distinguished Dissertation Award this year. Finally, the last one to um, point out is um, Andrew Fitzgibbon, who has got a Needham Award. He's in Microsoft, and I'd like to uh, um, invite him to stand up and uh, give the award to Alex, sponsored by Microsoft. Thank you. I told him I would speak for not more than 60 seconds, <laughs> um, because I also have a Needham story. The first lecture I attended, the first non um, sort of class lecture I attended as an undergraduate was given by Roger Needham. And um, I remember asking him, why, why wouldn't the attacker just wait for the nonce generator to roll over? And he told me about this amazing thing called the 32 bit integer, which of course we hadn't heard of at the time. It never occurred to me that you could have such big integers. Um, Needham went on to found the lab that I'm a happy member of. And I think that lab is fantastic for its continual desire to link fundamental research, crazy blue skies research, with real world delivery of product. And I'm really proud that we do it again and again. And we keep shipping great product from fundamental research. And here, I think, is another beautiful example of how fundamental research will really deeply impact our lives in many ways. So, Congratulations. We're very, very honored to give you this award. And uh, let me find it from here. <laughs> um, congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. And I just loved, thank, thank you, um, Andrew, and I just loved Bart talking about the uh, Needham Schroeder Award. It's, we've all of us hear the um, Needham stories. To have a Needham story from the Netherlands is actually rather lovely, but it's just everywhere. And now I'd like um, to introduce Pete O'Hearn from Facebook and UCL, who will um, close this event and give the vote of thanks. So, um, Alexandra, that was incredibly inspiring. And you started off by mentioning several slogans. So I'm going to um, quote a few slogans here. So, move fast and break things. Actually, in this talk that you saw me give, I contrasted that with what I thought is the field of program verification should have its own slogan, which is move slow and break almost nothing. <laughs> and the remarkable thing in your work is your br bridging these two worlds. So you have your other slogan, which is wonderful, which is um, keep calm and have solid foundations, I believe it was. Um, and this is the really remarkable thing about your work and your talk is that often people think that there's this divide between theory and practice. So on the one hand, we have beautiful principles in theory, and we have practice that makes a difference, has an impact, and it's very hard to bridge them. But in this work, this is such an amazing example of what you can get out of having solid theory and bridging it and getting to the practice. So for instance, um, in Professor Jacob's introduction, he mentioned co-algebras and co-algebraorphisms, which is the kind of thing I would have talked to Alec 
to Alex about years ago. And on the other hand, in her talk, although many of the ideas come from that, she never mentioned that. She's able to describe her results to do with compositionality and language design and scale without even mentioning some of the theory that it comes from. You see, this is when the theory is very powerful. I like to put it, it's a prescriptive theory. It's not only a descriptive theory. People often make theories that can describe things but don't necessarily have an outcome. And the outcome is very powerful when you can describe that outcome without even mentioning the theory. And that's the level that Alex is reaching in this kind of work, and that's what's very rare. The results are so powerful that you can, men you can talk about the outcome of the theory without even mentioning the theory. So Alex, this is really an amazing example to people of what you can get by keeping calm and having solid foundations. So congratulations and thank you, Alex.